swimmers, take your marks. Anybody want to fess up that that's probably what you would look like if you were trying this? How many of you got some good hours of watching some Olympics in this week? Man, what, what a week. But what I find is when it's Olympic time, everything becomes a sporting event. Anybody else had that? Anybody else want to fess up to that? Like, how many of you have had to water your lawns lately? Anybody been doing that? Because they literally look like toast right now. So I've got one of those garden hose reel boxes. So it had been out at night. I turned the water off. It was late the night before. I didn't want to reel the whole thing in. Double hose line, you know, it went out way out around the yard there. So I went out the next day, and I'm like, all right, time to go. I'm like, wait a minute. What if this was an Olympic event? I'm like, all right, Russell. Here we go, baby. Ready? All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I want to stop the burn. The, suck it up, buttercup. The burn. The burn. Oh, keep going. Keep, yeah, the crowd goes nuts. You know? Pretty sure, even though it was just me, I think I still got the silver somehow. I'm not even, not even sure how that happens. But what an amazing week of Olympic events it's been. My favorite events to watch are the swimming and the volleyball. Rachel loves the gymnastics. So between those events, there was plenty of excitement this past week. How many of you watched some gymnastics? The team overall gold to the ladies. Uh, Simone and Allie also got gold and silver in the individual all around. Swimming. Pick a swimmer. <laughs> like, it seemed like everybody like, was winning this week, whether it was watching Michael Phelps or Simone Manuel, Katie Ledecky, or for UI fan, IU fans, Lily King and Cody Miller. Uh, what a week that they had. I don't want to leave you Purdue fans out, especially because Mike's on the sound and he can cut me off at any time that he wants. So uh, Steele Johnson and David, they've got silver in the diving contest. I'm going to actually talk about them a little bit more later on. So we started our series last week by pointing out that there is, there's so much that we can learn from the Olympians that we are watching. The Apostle Paul, who wrote half of the books in our New Testament portion of the Bible, uses illustrations from the Olympics because his readers were familiar with them just as much back then as we are today. And the reason Paul used these illustrations is because there is so much to be learned from the athletes who competed in these games when we compare what they go through to what we go through in our lives here on earth. Paul likens our faith journey to these long runs that the runners participated in those Olympics many years ago. And in this series, we're looking at a few of these lessons that can benefit us as we seek to run our races better and in a way that will bring honor to God. And we're also seeing that what we run for is something that is far more valuable than gold. Now, last week, I asked you to imagine the U.S. Olympic Committee coming to your house and informing you that you have been selected to represent them in the next Olympics. You're going to be given the opportunity to be on the team and compete in the race. And the reality is, as we talked about, is that we've all been given this opportunity when it comes to our race of faith. When we open our hearts and our lives to let Jesus in, he says, you're on my team now, and I want you to represent me to the rest of the world. You are in the race every single day, and you need to run in such a way as to win it in the end. But as we focused on last week, we can't do this well if we don't have discipline in our lives. Spiritual champions need discipline. And most of us, when we're really honest about it, we would not be able to say that we're very disciplined in those areas that matter the most in our faith journey. Maybe you're disciplined at work or another area of your life, but you aren't very disciplined when it comes to being in God's word or prayer or being closely connected with other Christ followers or other disciplines that can draw you closer to the one true God. And as a result of this, when things get tough, when the obstacles rise up, when the heat is on and the pressure is intense, instead of rising to the challenge in your faith, you end up faltering, fading quickly, or crumbling altogether. When we think of having disciplines in our lives, I told you that it's not a matter of trying harder, but a, a rather a matter of training wisely. Trying harder for the short term is no substitute for training wisely for the long haul. Now, Mike Shear here is a buddy of mine. And you know, when you see Mike, it's welcome to the gun show. All right? Now, I've looked at Mike before, and I've had moments where I thought, man, I would love to look like Mike. Now, I can go, and I can bust it, and I can lift weights as hard as I can every day for two weeks. But you know what's going to happen at the end of the two weeks? I'm just going to go, come on! 
right? I can try harder. Then I get to two weeks, and I'm like, not even worth it, right? But that's what we try to do. We think it's the same for our races of faith. We can't realistically expect to be these great spiritual athletes and champions by putting in a lot of effort for just short periods of time. We have to be consistent, deliberate, focused, and committed for the long haul. Then we will see how God builds us up and makes us strong in the areas that matter the most. So being disciplined is a critical component of our faith race. And today I want to add another element to what we learn from these Olympians. It's something that we see, especially in those athletes that rode their bikes for over six hours straight in the road races. Something we see in the marathon runs, the open water swims, and those volleyball and tennis matches that go on forever. And that key component to being a champion is perseverance. Discipline is what keeps us ready for the race, but perseverance is what makes sure that we actually finish it no matter what happens along the journey. Let me give you a definition of perseverance so we're all on the same page. Perseverance is the ability or strength to continue or last, especially despite fatigue, stress, or other adverse conditions. And if you've been watching the Olympics, you've seen this plenty of times, haven't you? In the bike road races, anybody get to watch some of those? In the bike road races alone, there were all kinds of obstacles in the race. There was a section of cobblestone that they had to race over, caused a whole bunch of flat tires, strong crosswinds to fight against, long climbs, and dangerously steep and curvy descents where there were some serious accidents. A number of very skilled riders were taken out by these obstacles, and they could not continue. But life is a lot like those race courses, isn't it? There's certainly plenty of obstacles in our way along the way, and they come in all shapes and all sizes. And unlike the cyclists who have a good idea of what is coming next on the course, we often don't, which makes it even that much more challenging for us. Perseverance is what determines whether or not we will get back up again, whether we will brush ourselves off, and whether we will continue in the race that God has marked out for us. At the 1968 Olympics in Mexico, John Stephen Akwari from Tanzania ran into the, he was in the marathon event. And during the event, he cramped up badly from the high altitude of the city. He had not trained at such a high altitude back in his home country. And at about the 12 mile point during this 26.2 mile race, several runners were jockeying for position and he was hit and he fell to the ground, badly wounding his knee and dislocating the joint, plus hurting his shoulder. And he had a choice to make at that point. Would he stay down? a choice that nobody would blame him for, considering his injuries, or would he get back up and finish the race? He chose to get back up again, and he ended up finishing the race. And he finished last out of 57 runners. And while the top time for the event was just a little over two hours and 20 minutes, his time ended up being a little over three hours and 25 minutes. And there were only a few thousand people left in the stadium by the time he finished. And when he was interviewed later and was asked about why he continued the race, he said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. My country sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. That is the heart of a champion. That's the heart of somebody who realizes that there is something more important than just receiving temporary gold medals. There is something bigger at stake representing well those who send you. How much more should we have that same mindset when it comes to our faith? We know that there is more at stake than what we see in this temporary life. Eternity is on the line. And we want to represent the one who sends us, Jesus Christ himself, in such a way as to run the race to the best of our ability, fully relying on his strength through us to help us get back up and run again after we fall. John Akwari kept the knowledge that he was a representative at the forefront of his mind throughout his race. We need to do the same thing with our Savior. Now, what are some of the things that you can do to have better perseverance in this faith race that we are in? If you have your Bible with you today, go ahead and open up the Hebrews chapters 11 and 12. If you don't have your Bible, we'll have the verses up on the screen for you. And once again, this race analogy is used. Now, before we get to our key verses in chapter 11, let me talk first about chapter 11. In chapter 11, the author is talking about living out our faith. 
or in this instance, running our races of faith. So in chapter 11, we read example after example of these men and women who, come, who came before us and who have endured through so many things. This may have been included in the letter to the people in the first century after Jesus returned to heaven because they were getting ready to enter themselves into a time of trials and persecution from the governments and the leaders of the mostly pagan culture at that time. These people mentioned in chapter 11 are heroes of our faith, and each of them faced plenty of opposition and trials during their lives. But they endured to the end of their lives, and they are held up as examples to the rest of us on how to run our races today with perseverance. So having this idea of chapter 11 in the back of your minds, now let's take a look at the first two verses of chapter 12 where it says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Now let's break these two verses down a little bit to see how they encourage us to run the race with perseverance. First, it says that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now imagine the track stadium, completely full of people. But these, just, these aren't just your typical fans like we see in the Olympics. These people are all, what the scripture says, witnesses. Meaning that they are witnesses to what God can do in the life of a surrendered person. They are people like the list in chapter 11 who have gone before us on the road of faith and finished their races, and now they are in the stands cheering us on as we are on our journey. They understand fully the challenges that we are facing, the difficulties that we come up against, the desire to throw in the towel, the pain of trying to push through when you have nothing left, and the feeling of failure that we all experience at different times in our lives. But they are also great reminders to us of people who have been there and continue to fight and finish their races. I mean, we can draw strength from their examples, and that helps us to persevere in the toughest times. So let me ask you this. How full is your stadium? When we put it in this context. If this is your race, and the people are there for you. How many people are in your stadium? Because we're not talking about everybody now. We're talking about those who have gone before, who have surrendered their lives to God and are those examples for us. And their life example is the encouragement that we need. If that's our criteria, how full is your stadium? Who is in the stands that is cheering you on that is already finished their race of faith. Each time you read the story of a faithful person in the Bible, you add them to your stands. Each time you read a book about a person in more recent times, maybe something like about Mother Teresa and the life she lived and how she devoted it to God, you add another person to your stands. See, how full your stands are, that's totally up to you. And if they're not, then you're missing out on a key component. When you fail to be in God's word and you fail to read about the life example of other Christians who have gone before us, you rob yourself of one of the great resources that God uses to encourage us in our faith and to help us run the race with perseverance. How many people are in your stands right now and what do you need to start doing with intentionality to increase that number? We also learn perseverance from those witnesses that are still around us today. People who are further down the faith journey race than we are, who can mentor us and who can pour into our lives so that we can learn from them and grow wiser as we each run our own race. Now, how many of you said you watched quite a bit of swimming this week? <clears throat> I loved on several occasions there was reference for the swimmers about how they received letters from the previous champions. Did you guys see that? They were talking about how the previous champions actually wrote them letters to encourage them. And it reminds us of the impact that each generation needs to have on this next generation. We need to have people who are wiser than us, who have gone before us, who have been successful in this faith journey, and we need to get people who are further down the road and ask them to speak into our lives. 
But again, that's something you have to do with intentionality. It's not just going to happen. Who are you asking to speak in your life with intentionality right now? Who are you learning from? Who are you going to and saying, I know I need to be more disciplined with my prayer life, and you seem to be a very diligent prayer. Would you share with me what you do and why it has made such a big difference in your life? Or maybe you need to go to somebody and say, I don't know my Bible. I've noticed that you seem to have a good understanding of it. Can you help me get started with being more intentional about reading my Bible? Such a simple step to take, but you have to do it with intentionality if you want to run your race the best way possible. Who can you talk to this week about an area of your life where you would like to grow stronger? Humble yourself and learn from these other people and you will be blessed and you will learn things that will help you to persevere better in your race. You are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. But it's not enough to just know that we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. We're supposed to do something as a result of this knowledge. So let's go back to our verse, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, in other words, therefore, as a result of knowing this, you should do this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Guys, when we look at this amazing cloud of witnesses that have gone before us, it encourages us to run our races better. But every day, you and I make hundreds of decisions, and each of those decisions either helps us to keep running our race effectively, or it causes us to get distracted or derailed completely. And many of you have heard me say this before, the simplest definition of sin that I can come up with is choosing our way over God's way. And we do that all the time, don't we? And every time we do that, we are adding a weight, we are adding a burden, we are adding a hindrance to our ability to run the race well. So we're being told here that if we want to run the race well, we need to get rid of those things that are holding us back and slowing us down. It says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Get rid of it so that you can run your race with perseverance. Now let me give you a visual for this idea. Let's use the example of the U.S. swim team. Take a look at this picture. I just took this picture with my phone off the TV last night, watching this. This was the relay last night. But look at this picture. This picture captures exactly what I'm talking about. Whenever Michael and his teammates enter the arena, they're covered in extra gear. A lot of times they have their headphones on, they have their pullover hoodies on, they have running pants on, and as you can see in this picture, a hoodie coat as well. Now imagine with me what it would be like if Michael decided to just stay in that gear. Imagine that it's getting closer and closer to his leg of the relay, and he is just standing looking just like that, minus the goofy facial expression I happen to catch right there. He's the third leg of the relay. The first guy is in right now, okay? That's all right. He'll be ready in time. But then the second guy dies in, and he's still standing there. People would be looking at him strangely in a bit of a panic, wouldn't they? Then it's his turn to get on the starting block, and everybody would be stunned as he gets up on the block dressed exactly like that. And then he dives in the water. Can you imagine what that would look like? All that extra stuff. Can you imagine how much that would slow him down, how much that would serve to pull him under as he tries to do the butterfly for the 100-meter race? If you were there and you saw Michael standing there and not getting ready for his race, what would you want to say? Dude, it's go time. Get ready. Get rid of all this stuff that is going to hold you back so that you can be as effective as possible in your race. It is so obvious when we put it in this context, isn't it? Take off everything that hinders you. Now, if you're a runner... I don't want to get any reports this week that there were nude runners in Goshen. And they said, well, our pastor said, <laughs> all right, it's an analogy. <laughs> don't take it. But it's so easy to understand when we're talking about the swimming relays. But what about in our own races of faith? Has the light bulb gone on there yet? 
Get rid of all the stuff that is going to hold you back so that you can effectively as possible run your race well. That means that in some areas of your life, you need to start making wiser decisions. That means that there's a sin that you struggle with over and over again, and maybe it's time you tell somebody about that struggle, or maybe you even need to go get counseling to help you through it. That's okay. Get rid of all the stuff that is holding you back from running the race well. Maybe that means that you need to change the circle of friends that you primarily hang out with. Maybe that means that you need to change up how you're using your time for various different things. Maybe it means that you need to let go of some literal stuff because it's become too much of a priority for you and it's holding you back from fully running towards God. Get rid of whatever it is that is holding you back and pulling you down so that you can run your race well. The challenge that we have is much more difficult than these Olympians face. Their big race is something that lasts from anywhere from 20 seconds to 7 hours. Our race is continual. We don't have the luxury of taking it easy in between events. Our race is this continual event that lasts our entire lives. So the struggle to get rid of those things that slow us down and get us tangled up in a daily struggle, a daily battle, those are things that have to be constantly won on a daily basis. And with God's strength, we can do that. Let's go back to our verses one last time here. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and the rest of it. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And that's the last part of this, is fixing our eyes on Jesus. The only way that we run a successful race is if we keep our focus on the prize, which is being more like Jesus here on earth and being with Jesus for all of eternity. And that requires us to be laser focused on what it is that we are running towards. People who are chasing the American dream, they're not focused on Jesus. They're focused on money and stuff. People who are chasing popularity and notoriety aren't focused on Jesus. They're too busy admiring their own image in the mirror and taking selfies. There are so many things that can so easily distract us from the primary goal that God has given to us, which is to run towards Jesus with everything that we've got. But we have to focus on the right things, otherwise we come up short of completing our race well. Focus matters. In the 2004 Summer Olympics, which were held in Athens, Greece, there was an American Olympian named Matthew Emmons, and he was shooting, literally, for the gold medal in the five-meter, three-position rifle final, standing, kneeling, prone, laying down. Amazing story. All this guy had to do was hit something remotely close to the center target, and he had a gold medal. So he takes aim, he prepares, he slows his heartbeat, and he pulls the trigger side right in the middle gold medal was his right well there was just one problem he did indeed hit the bullseye but it was of the wrong target from gold medal to eighth place one bad shot he hit the wrong target maintaining focus throughout our race is vital Maintaining focus throughout our race also helps to keep things in perspective. It reminds us of what is truly important and what things have less significance. It reminds us who we are and whose we are on a regular basis. It reminds us that our ultimate identity is in our relationship with Jesus Christ, not in any accolades that we may receive here in our time on earth, even if that is an Olympic medal. I mentioned earlier that Steele and David won the silver in the men's 10-meter synchronized diving competition this last week. And these are two men from Purdue. Got to get you there, Mike. All right. These are two men who, even though they've been focused on winning a medal for Team USA, they have always kept that in perspective compared to the bigger goal that they are aiming at with their lives. So take a look at this interview that took place right after they won their silver medals. A little different perspective than I've been hearing from most of the athletes. 
What a difference from so many of the other stories out there. I have heard athlete stories this past week and a half where they have been so devastated by Olympic losses in the past that it took them years to move on. And for some, getting a medal or not getting a medal was the only thing in their lives that gave it meaning. Yet here we see two successful Olympians who had things in their proper perspective. Their focus was clear. There's nothing wrong with going after an Olympic medal, trying to be the best in the world at what you do. Nothing wrong with that. But as these guys point out quite clearly, it's not the ultimate prize we should be seeking after. The ultimate prize is Jesus himself, and that dwarfs any other award or reward we could possibly get here. And if they hadn't won a medal that day, I guarantee you that interview would be the exact same afterwards. Their true identity is in Christ alone, as ours should be as well. That's focus. That's perspective. And that's what helps those two men run their race with perseverance very, very well. Now, last week, I gave you a couple questions to consider about how you were doing with discipline in your faith race. And this week, I want to give you a couple questions to think on that relate to these key components of perseverance as well. The first two I said earlier in the message. First one, who are you going to add to your cloud of witnesses? That's on you. You learning the stories of those who have gone before you, whether that's in Scripture, best source, of course, but there's a lot of great books about people in more modern times that have also lived faithfully for God. And each time you take in that story, each time that you learn from somebody who's gone before you, you add another person into your stands to help you persevere and be encouraged. Second question, who are you going to add to your life as a mentor? If I were to ask you that right now, not, not about work, I'm not talking about a work mentor or you know those kinds of things. I'm saying like, when it comes to your faith run, who is serving as your mentor right now? Do you have somebody serving as your mentor right now? And that can be an easy step as well. Who is somebody that you look up to? Who is somebody that you trust? Somebody that you know loves you and loves Jesus? Maybe you start talking to them about mentoring you, maybe in a specific area of your life to begin with, and maybe it becomes more general after that. But do something. Be intentional, because having a mentor in your life helps you run your race better. Another question is, what sin is holding you back, and what do you need to do about it so that you can shed everything that holds you back from running your race well? Now, my guess is a lot of us can take some reflective time and think about this and come up with some answers for that. And maybe it's about bringing in some people who are close to you and just saying, hey, I'm giving you permission to speak into my life from what you've heard, from what you've seen about how I live my life. Would you help me to see some areas that I need to focus on letting God in and giving God the lordship of more so that I can run my race better? And then the final one, is your identity in Christ alone or are you allowing somebody else or something else to decide who you are. That happens all the time. And we don't even know it, does it? I mean, like if you walked away from your job today, whether you intended it or not, especially this seems to be a little bit more for guys, but so much identity gets sucked up in what we do for a living. And we walk away from that and it's like, uh, that's a big part of my identity right there. And we do it with all kinds of things. Okay? Families, you do that too. Moms, your kids, dads with your kids. Like, just say like, okay, that's, that's out of the picture now. Like, where's my, where's my identity now? That's, that's what I've known. That's what I've been known for. And those are some, some great things there. But ultimately, is your identity in Christ? Above all of those other things, is your identity really in Christ? And only you can answer that and be honest enough to answer that. And if the answer is no, because there's this competing for his attention, this competing for his attention and the reality is when you're running your race you find yourself distracted over here and over here and over here and over here and all these distractions are keeping you from running the race really really well and Jesus says I want you to get rid of that I want you to throw it off it's a hindrance to you doing all that I want you to do but 
he doesn't force us. He leaves that up to each one of us. So make the decision today to do whatever it takes to add people to your cloud of witnesses, to throw off everything that is hindering you from running your race well and recommitting yourself to laser focus on God's plan for your life and nobody else's. Let's pray. God, we're so grateful for uh, this series and the, the chance to be able to put this material together and the examples that you give us uh, from daily life and from the Olympics that are so, uh, so easy to apply to our spiritual race, our journey with you. And I pray that what we talked about today would just really settle in our souls this week, that we would just be honest enough to answer these questions about who are these people in our lives that are serving as our cloud of witnesses. And God, if we're just honestly just saying, you know what, there's just hardly anybody in my stands right now, help us to do something about that, because it's never too late. You want to surround us with people whose lives have been committed to you and serve as an encouragement to us, but we have to choose to engage with those lives. I pray that you would be with people who take this challenge seriously today of finding a mentor. I pray that you would just put somebody on their heart that they know loves them and loves you and give them the humility to say, you know what, I need other people speaking into my life because I want to run this race well and I feel like you do it really well in this area. Would you be willing to pour into my life so that I can run it better in that area as well? God, when it comes to our sins that hold us back, I know for me, I look back through the years and there's a long, long list of just time after time where I make a decision that is all about me and has nothing to do with seeking you first. And every day we make those decisions and every day those decisions can derail us and slow us down and bog us down from coming fully after you. And God, I just pray that you would stir in our souls and spirits today Give us a renewed passion for following after you, for throwing off everything that hinders us, for throwing off everything that holds us back, whatever conversations need to take place, whatever behavior needs to change, whatever mentality needs to change. Would you help us to do that in the strength of Jesus Christ? Because we want our identity to be firmly in him and nothing else. Be with us this week, Lord as we continue to enjoy the Olympics, as we continue to enjoy this imagery on a day-to-day -day basis of running this race, because we are in this race every day of our lives as we follow after you, and we want to run it really, really well. And as we're going to talk about next week, Lord, we look forward to that day of receiving that prize that is far more valuable and beyond gold. In Jesus' name we pray. Hey, I just got to let you know, the video I'm using next week, man, I am already stoked about next week. Like, if we could fast forward, I'd be like, mm, let's go. <laughs> so I hope you guys uh, make a commitment to being here next week. Go out there. Uh, any of you guys, I know you're going to go home. Garden Hose Olympics. You got to let me know what your time. Text me your times, and I'll see if I can do better. If you need some prayer, we got some uh, guys over here that are more than happy to pray with you this morning if you got something going on. Otherwise, we'll see you guys next week.